This episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast is brought to you by On Point Pomade. Keep your beard and hair looking on point with their line of pomades and beard oils over at onpointpomade.com. Use our code BSP15 at checkout and get 15% off your total purchase order. So thanks again to On Point Palme for sponsoring our show. This episode is also sponsored by the Bean Bastard Coffee. Head over to thebeanbastard.com and pick up any one of their delicious hand-roasted coffees. Coffee lovers will also enjoy their hand-cut and handmade espresso candles and soaps as well. If you're in the Buffalo, New York area, head to their store located at 448 Elmwood Avenue. And thanks again to the Bean Bastard for supporting this show. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. With over 500,000 officially licensed items in their online store, you're guaranteed to find something you need. Use our code BRUTALLY and get 10% off your total purchase order. Now on to the show. What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John, and this episode's guest is Sean Cooper of Taken Back Sunday and Stray Light Run. This was a fun one. Sean is actually promoting a new live record from Stray Light Run called Live at the Patch Hog Theater. Uh, It's a live album that they recorded uh, over a decade ago, and it was supposed to be a CD-DVD combo, and basically the video footage just got messed up, and so they sat on it. Um, They sat on it for all this time, and are now finally releasing the live record uh, as a full Uh, on September 17th, which by the time you're hearing this is in about a week. Uh, I'm preemptively recording this before I go to Atlanta, so there's still an episode to drop even while I'm on vacation, because you know what? I still want to get you guys great episodes, and I still want to give you content week after week. Um, But this was a lot of fun talking with Sean. Uh, We don't necessarily keep it too much on Stray Light Run or Taken Back Sunday, really. It's just kind of... um, a really loose conversation. Uh, we talk about shower beers. We talk about uh, just the interesting skyrocketing success of Stray Light Run leaving Taking Back Sunday at basically, quote unquote, their pinnacle. Uh, and then starting another band and having equal success and just kind of staying with Victory Records and uh, having kids versus not having kids and just, you know, running the gamut of, of a lot of different topics. And uh, speaking of running the gamut... Um, I, the beer I'm going to have, speaking of shower beers and all those things, uh, I have a beer from New Holland Brewery, which, uh, you know, here it's literally across the street from the bar I work at. Uh, they have a beer called two truths, one lie and holy shit. Is it delicious? It is a, it is a hard seltzer. Technically, (laughs) uh, it is a pineapple ice cream seltzer. And this thing, when you pour it, it's a nice pink hue. It's very light. It's crisp. It's refreshing. And when I read it, I was like, an ice cream seltzer. I don't know about that. And I am here to tell you I am all about that. I do know about it. And I am just excited that, you know, there are these crazy-ass beers that are getting made by New Holland right now. They have another one, the Painkiller, like I had talked about earlier, that is basically like a take on the the Painkiller cocktail. Um, and I went out to the new Holland out in Holland and they still had it on tap. So I was able to enjoy some of that with some friends and, oh man, it was so good. Um, crap beer, man, we are just in a really interesting time period right now. Uh, we are changing seasons from summer, getting ready to move into fall. Uh, really excited for hoodie, light jackets, 
hanging outside when it's colder, doing some bonfires and so forth. It is my favorite time of year. And uh, the beers are coming aplenty. The whiskeys, the flavored pumpkin things, pumpkin spice. I had a pumpkin spice latte the other day. I am all about basic bitch season, as it were. <laughs> so uh, very much looking forward to uh, to getting into these fall beers, these pumpkin beers, trying them again. And uh, you know what I'm excited about? Getting into this conversation with Sean Cooper. So let's get into it, and I will talk to you all on the other side of it. Essentially gives the vibe of what I wanted the show to be because some people are like, oh, it's drinking. And I go, yes, but no. Um, uh, it's essentially like why everyone likes podcasts, which is, you know, it's like being a fly fly on the wall, like over a conversation people have, like when they're at a bar or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so then I saw this and then where like the taps are because uh, the actual image has the taps right where we are. But I was like, oh, it's perfect because like it's, yeah. it's nice and light. So it's not dark and like, all right, now we're talking about metal. Like, yeah adds a little bit of a lighter atmosphere to the whole thing but uh so far i like it but uh i'm going through a bit of a rebrand uh here soon where i'm actually having someone design a template that'll go over all this stuff so it's at least consistent in all the branding everywhere excellent yeah because you know i'm sure you being in a band uh you started being in a band because you love making music with your friends and uh then all of a sudden you had to learn about marketing and budgets and <laughs> tour routing and a whole bunch of other things that you were like i didn't sign up for any of this no no, no. And I still don't know that much about it. That's why now, thankfully, we hire good people to take care of that. And I can just like kind of check stuff out and kind of get an idea after and they kind of explain it to me. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not at that level. So everything good, bad or indifferent has to be reliant on me and either a, a harebrained idea I have and going like, I think that works. Maybe yeah. we'll find out. <laughs> no, no, it's always worth a shot. But yeah, it's a very eye opening experience. And then it kind of shows you how much do I want it? Do I do I want to deal with all this stuff? I do. I do. It's worth it. Well, I mean, it's kind of funny because like uh, when I had Matt Carter on a while ago, uh, probably actually talked to him about a month and a half ago. I think we just released it like two weeks ago. Um, but it was one of those things like he had never used this. But like with them doing like the bad Christian thing for a while, him and uh, Toby, um, he was like, I've never used this site. Like, how do you like it? And that's literally how we started. The thing was just kind of bullshitting about podcasters talking to another podcaster about technology that they use and like and i was like i've not really had the experience of like touring on a big scale or anything like that but i was like i imagine it's exactly how like when you, like first couple of days of tour you're like what are you running how do you like that i've been i've heard yeah. good things about this like and it's it's so inside baseball that it's just kind of like i don't know if anyone else is gonna dig this but maybe <laughs> they will because maybe they're like oh i've been thinking about doing a show or whatever and like there's some keys to the how to get started at least or whatever well, yeah, I mean, I think there's things too, like it's your personality. So you got to you gotta do what you know and what you like and you'll find your niche, whatever that is. You know, if it's talking podcasting gear, there's a niche for that. There's a niche for everything. <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember like when I had Steve Ebbett's uh, producer on a while mm-hmm. back and we just kind of talked about a bunch of different shit, but like most everyone was having him on and getting so nerdy about like, gear and like i think the only time we nerded out over gear was you know i was like dude you got to work with the cure like Uh and i know like you worked because you were helping ross robinson work with the cure but like you worked with the cure dude like what the fuck is that like and he goes so we were looking for you know it was really cool when i remember sitting at like lunch and robert smith had called me over to like have lunch with him at this like you know common area and then we were talking about something and He was like, oh, I always love the sound that this board got. And he goes, oh, yeah, that Neve console. I know where that is. Uh, Let me see if I can get it. And like, I know he had told that story on a few other podcasts subsequently afterward. But it was kind of funny that I was like, sorry, I didn't really talk about like producing really. And he goes, no, like I do that enough. Like, it's kind of fun just kind of talking about other things. And yeah, um, like I know we'll kind of get to why you're actually here, which, by the way, how do you pronounce this theater, by the way? Patchog. Okay, I was theater. I was way off. (laughs) Yeah, Long Island. Long Island definitely has some has some weird like Native American, American Indian names that that have carried over through the course of time. So like you grow up hearing them, and it's not foreign to me. 
but yeah, the, the spelling can can leave a little bit uh, little little confusing. Well, because the, the the joke I always make is so I'm from Delaware originally. So I have the East Coast in me that wants to pronounce things one way, but I live here in Michigan uh-huh. and it they have their own dialect and way of saying things. Some things I I don't and have never adopted. Same with like back home in Delaware, like people say water and roof and all that kind of stuff. And I don't say them like that either. Um, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Like when I see some words, the vowels are usually what will trip me up because I'm like, what what enunciation am I trying to put on this is it the east coast is it kind of the midwest here or, or what and yeah i knew i kind of figured it had to be something indian based uh or native uh, american based just mm-hmm. because here in michigan we have a lot of that yeah. um so looking at it but i i just it was like patch and then i was like is it patch or like you know like Patchogua? yeah yeah it was just like i was like oh man i am i have no idea how to even say that so i'm just gonna yeah. defer that to you <laughs> <laughs> No, it's smart. It's smart to ask if you don't know instead of just bungling through it, you know? Well, I mean, I know I think you're a little bit older than I am. I'm going to be 37 in like a month. But uh, I feel like that's something that we as people don't do well at is like admitting like just admitting you don't know something. Yeah. Like I don't feel like that's a problem at all. Like that's the only way you're going to learn. Like don't awkwardly try to bullshit your way through something. And then someone can be like, you don't know what you're talking about at all. And you're like, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely done that to myself. But, you know, I feel like teaching my kids, I try to teach them like, hey, just just ask. Like, it's OK. It's OK. And that's like I've learned that from them. Like, I can just ask. I don't have to pretend to know anything, because if you're talking to someone who really knows their stuff, they're going to know right away. You don't know what you're talking about. So if you try and hang, <laughs> you just look like you look foolish. So ask, ask the question. I'm happy to explain anything if someone doesn't you know, know something I know a little bit more about. Actually, there's a good question, I guess, for you. Speaking of kind of learning and growing as a person, like I I don't have kids and and never will. But Mm -hmm. I feel like the one thing I've noticed from people like friends having their own kids and so forth and watching them grow. Do you feel like. We as a as our generation, basically, we're kind of set up not to really know a whole lot that you can take it with you going forward, because I feel like the kids now, the way that they're learning the way they're just learning in general, I feel like is so conducive for actually solving problems. Not just, I read this thing, I retained it. Now I can regurgitate it back to you, but now they can legitimately explain and and have better tools to problem solve. Do you feel like you've seen that in kind of helping your children grow and, and maybe going through school? Yeah. I mean, especially with the pandemic doing, doing the homeschooling with them and stuff when, when things uh, really got bad in March of 2020, um, I had to kind of like relearn how I learned math to help my son along. Like they do it like kind of 10 base and they do lines for the 10 yeah. and little dots for the ones. And that's not how I learned math at all. Um, which I think is a much better way to teach. So I think that the evolution of the teaching system has, has gotten really, really good, especially where we live. So that was really fun to see. So I'm like, I have to reteach myself, but it makes me think about things. I'm just like, why did I have so much, why did I struggle so much with math as a kid? Well, that's why the way I was being taught was a bit archaic. So I think with the internet and and learning how people learn and and people learn in different ways. So I feel like my kids will have a better understanding for sure. So I I hope that, uh, you know, I've been playing in a band. I I haven't been going to college and learning how to teach kids, but there's so many people that have, and we have a lot of friends that are teachers. So I feel like all of that progress has been huge. Um, Hmm. So they definitely have a better understanding. And if you don't know something, you can just Google it. You don't have to go to the law or you take out the encyclopedia or something. So that that's a really awesome thing too. So I feel like I've become a better learner as, as I've gotten older and, and learned how to use the internet. Um, I was an early user of the internet. I had a computer and was on AOL and stuff when I was about 12. <laughs> ASL. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, it, I mean, it was crazy. Um, in those chat rooms and yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, who did you, male, who did know. you ever pretend to be back then? I never pretended to be anyone. I was always like me. Hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't really mess around or like role play or any of that. I was, I was just <laughs> this kid, but I was in like the punk rock chat rooms and things like that. But, but that was fun. But yeah, now, now knowing like how to do it and how to find real information and, and get it to my kids. Like now they're starting to understand, Hey dad, I, I want to understand how this works. Can we figure that out? I'm like, yeah, man, we'll find you a good YouTube video. Like we got access. I feel like at times, like I, I say all the time that, it's interesting that we literally have, you know, a wealth of knowledge on our devices, literally yep. in our pockets at all times. 
but how we somehow with so much access to to be smarter or more informed at least that we actually seemingly have gotten dumber um because i don't feel like we i was actually just having a conversation with a friend the other day about you know kind of again talking about how if you don't know something that's fine like just you know whatever ask questions or whatever Mm -hmm. but i was like adversely i feel like you have people who like i may read something and it may be something that sparks an idea and i'll go so i was reading this article i haven't had the time to really fact check it research it whatever but the the thing that made me the spark of the idea is still there and that's still valid and it's still a good possibly a launching point to talk about something but i don't feel like even we do that either like where people are willing to take responsibility to say that these aren't facts. This is an opinion and I haven't had it t- the time to even fact check what I'm saying. But like I said, at least owning to the fact that you're trying to flesh out an idea and still forming your own opinions on something. But I feel like it's interesting that people aren't even willing to say that. They're like, well, I saw it on this site and it's like, did you read it? No, I read the headline. I got the gist. And it's like, uh, that's, that's not, that's not how that works. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope that that is the next evolution in the step. Like I was saying, I'm 40 years old now. I was on the internet at 12. So like I definitely went down rabbit holes of looking at stuff and conspiracy theory and all this when I, but I was very young. So I have had the time to process and like come out of that. And like, I was a young impressionable kid and people are getting into this at an older age as internet access gets to people and smartphones and the whole thing. So I would, I would hope to think that the loudest, most controversial point of view we're hearing the loudest right now it's the people like you and i i think who are taking the time to process it off like i i'm not an expert in everything i'm not an expert in covid or vaccination or what's going on in afghanistan like all the things that are really hot button issues right now i'm like i need to take my time to process this and understand it so all the loudest points of view are the, the most reactionary people and that's not me so so I'm hoping what the next step in the game of knowledge and, and understanding is that people starting to see, OK, I'm going to take my time before I voice my opinion on this issue because I don't know. So so I think that's the next step. I, I don't know that it is, but that's my hope for a brighter future. I feel like the problem is, though, too, in addition to everyone just needing everything now and turning mm-hmm. things over, I feel like we're also in this weird first culture we're like the you know you see the comments first and like that's literally the comment and you're like what the why does that what does that do what what value does that add uh-huh. and i feel like that's the thing is like everyone wants to just talk about something and not learn um you know I, it's funny as i get older some of the isms that my my dad used to say to me just start ringing louder and truer as i get older where it's like you have two ears and one mouth for a reason and i'm like uh-huh. yeah that's that's a thing. That's that's a thing people should probably remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's good advice. And I think that's strong parenting, too. So that's what I try and instill in my kids, you know, and I, I feel like um, that, that's a big part in becoming a parent is understanding issues so you can explain them. Like my kids are, are uh, four and seven. So mm-hmm. like I need to, to take things down to a level that they can understand. It's like, yeah, I do have two times as many ears as my mouth. So that's a, that's a good point of view. So, uh, you know, I also think with the, the first culture and stuff like that maybe these kids aren't getting enough attention. So like, well, I need to comment on this music video, but if I write first, I'm going to get some attention here. Like I'm the first one in cool. Well, what, what does that get you? Like you said, it doesn't get you anything. It's not, you're not producing anything. So what you're there, you didn't watch the thing you're commenting on and you're so excited about it to get that attention. Well, isn't that sad? Like, you gotta, I don't know, like, I think parents got to be more attentive with their kids and also to like help explain like, yo, this isn't real attention. This isn't good. What? And I think that's, that's so like, I know, and, and it's funny. Cause like, I love all kinds of, I mean, as I clearly have a Kanye bear next to me and, you know, mm-hmm. Aaliyah skateboards and stuff like I'm into other things other than predominantly yeah. metal, which is what everyone assumes I am uh-huh. only about. But so when I say this name, I don't know if it means anything to you, like, but like doc Coyle that is in bad wolves, um, but used to be in God forbid, you know, he and I had talked about, you know, just social media and like, it's still so new. And what does it do to performers and entertainers and something that him and I 
always talk about and have a relationship with is basketball and professional sports. Uh-huh. And, you know, there's this debate about, you know, who's the greatest? Is it LeBron? Is it Kobe? Is it MJ? And, you know, and the game changes too much, just like music. You can't really, it's apples to oranges. But at the end of the day, something that we talked about that, you know, at least that LeBron should, that really can't be negated is that LeBron has his whole career has always been in the 24 hour news cycle that we now live Mm in. He's always had to be on. He's always been scrutinized. Like if you looked at the high school games, when they used to play them on uh, ESPN primetime, it would show like the greatest NBA players ever from the whole history of the game. And then it's like, and then here's LeBron as a high school athlete. And you're like that the expectations good, bad or indifferent that he had to live up to MJ never had to go through. He never uh-huh. was under that much scrutiny. Yeah, he may have been the biggest icon globally, and maybe LeBron's not there, but it's like MJ never had to deal with – like, can you imagine if after MJ's dad died, you had people just having, in theory, a direct line to him, or after a bat, like the flu game or some of his bad games, like, or when he retired to play baseball. Can you imagine the people – the fuck you comments and burning of his jerseys and stuff that could have happened yeah. that he didn't have to deal with? And then seeing it consistently being talked about on the new, like ESPN and stuff like that, it's like that didn't exist. So we really should commend and laud the athletes that are coming out now where they literally have to be on and available 24-7. And what does that do to your psyche in addition to having to be one of the best athletes in the world? Yeah, yeah, it, it's very interesting. And and also, I mean, to to a further degree and, and a little bit different is like you had these people who were the biggest stars in the world at the time. Like I, people talk about the Olympics ratings being down and stuff. Well, every four years, there's a whole lot more content. There's a whole lot more channels. There's Netflix, there's Disney Plus, there's ESPN Plus. There's like, so you're being pulled in 80 million different directions. So it's like, sure, ratings are down, but less people are watching network TV. That's just the way it is. So it's like a guy like Michael Jordan was one of the most popular guys in the world. Like, I don't know if LeBron has the same cachet. He's he's one of the greatest of all time, undoubtedly. But like, it, it's just like you had like Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Mike Tyson, Madonna. Like these were icons. And I can't imagine the pressure that is. So LeBron definitely has a ton of pressure on him and the scrutiny for a very, very long time. So it's just interesting to think like, Maybe it's spread out a little bit more, so it's a tiny bit easier in that respect, but it's over a longer period of time. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's fun to think about. And I think like a lot of times the people that are arguing like greatest of all time and stuff, it's like, can't we just let these people be in their own like place? And with it without the scrutiny of comparing LeBron to a Michael Jordan to a Kobe, like like <laughs> let the guys be like, holy shit, they're amazing. These are these are like once in a generation kind of stars. And isn't that spectacular? Like, who cares over all time? Jesus Christ, give the guy a break. Well, I mean, like, even like when The Last Dance came out recently, yeah, my dad apparently had watched it. And he goes, I watched that and I realized I missed out on this opportunity to spend time with you. Like, because I, I mean, we live in Michigan, so we used to get almost all the Bulls games, and I'm a huge nice. Dennis Rodman fan. So, yeah, that was prime Dennis Rodman for me being able to watch him like every other day, basically for three years and you know i would ask him like hey this game's gonna be on do you want to watch the game nah go ahead and watch it and he was like i just he goes it's not bad parenting because i knew you loved it and i just wasn't as into it as you he goes but i realized they missed out on getting to experience one of the like potentially like the greatest basketball team of all time and like this just era of great basketball and i was like yeah for sure. Like I have those memories of watching all those things and I still have like my sports illustrated from then and stuff like that. So I can go back and remember, but I go, but I feel like there's so many people who are like, well, when I first got into this and you can correlate it to music too, where it's like, this is as good as it'll ever get. And it's like, yeah, no, like there were some lean years when Kobe, like when MJ retired and it was Kobe, but it's like, you had your Tim Duncans, you had your, you know, some of the players, Kobe and the ending of Shaq. And then you started ushering in like Dwayne Wade, LeBron, and you know, some of the players, like it's still weird to me, like Kevin Garnett. I remember coming straight out of high school and that was a big thing. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And now like I've already lived and gone past his whole career. And now he's a hall of famer. I'm like, I don't feel like that much time went away, um, went by. And then in the last year, my wife and I went to New Orleans right before the pandemic. I got to see, and sorry if you're not a big basketball fan, but kind of mm-hmm. speaking to, to this, like I got to see Ja Morant for the Grizzlies and Zion Williamson for the Pelicans and then went to Atlanta with a friend a couple of months ago, saw the uh, the Hawks in the playoff game against uh, 
the Knicks and got mm-hmm. to see like all these new players that are basically going to be the next stars. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm getting to see like the next ushering in era. Like I've essentially gone through almost four generations of great basketball and people just don't appreciate it because they're, they're too focused on, well, this was when it was good. And I feel like, you know, listening back to this, this live album, I was thinking about this era of music because, you know, with you guys being both bands, taking back Sunday and yeah. straight light run being on victory, Victory was huge for me back in the yeah. early 2000s, you know, with Atreyu, with bands like Aiden. Mm-hmm. Like, they were the band that broke every good band, seemingly. Like, it was like uh-huh. them, Trust Kill, Solid State. Like, there were labels uh-huh. when labels were important. Yeah. And to me, it was funny listening back to this record and just being like, man, I'm sure there were people who were like, that chose sides, like, well, I'm taking yeah. back Sunday, I'm Straylight Light Runner, whatever. And uh-huh. it's like, why can't you just like both? Why can't you support the bands that you like or the mem- like you obviously like these dudes when they were in this other band. Why uh-huh. can't you support them now? Yeah. I mean, I understand if the stray life stuff didn't connect with taking back Sunday fans and stuff, it was certainly very different, but, um, but yeah, I think that's a big thing. And that, that's what we see all over, whether it's politics or sports, like everyone wants their own team. They want, they want the side, they want to win the argument. And, and that's fine, you know, if that's your thing. But, yeah, I've always been a kind of guy, like, I'll, I'll follow whatever. You know, like, I listen to all the Beatles solo stuff, you know? And I'm not going to argue over who's better. I'm going to enjoy the songs I like, and that's going to be it. Like, I, I find it very hard to to argue about art. It's like, I just like this. I don't know why it connects. It just does. So that's the way I've kind of always been. And, and I, I mean, I guess I, I don't like arguing either over, <laughs> over things that are, you know, when, when there's no, like, right or wrong. It's art. What it's funny. I saw a meme yesterday and it was someone stating a a quote unquote fact. And they're like, well, that's my opinion. They're like, factually, you're wrong. And they're like, well, that's my opinion. It's like, no, but this is a fact like a plus like, you know, essentially a plus B equals C or, you know, whatever. Uh And then the person's just like, but that's my opinion. And it's like, you can have an opinion, but when it's something that you're dealing in facts and truths, it's not necessarily opinions can't factor into that. It's uh-huh. when you're talking about something that's very uh, – I'm blanking on the word I wanted to use. But uh, basically, like music. Yeah. I, I I know there's music that's not – inherently not good. Like, And I can uh-huh. tell you why, like, compared to something else, like, from a composition, from a production standpoint, yeah, this, this may not be the best thing. But then I can uh-huh. also sit there and go, but this is what it makes me feel. This is uh-huh. why I like this. And in that capacity, not wrong. Yeah. But you can come by and go like, oh, I hate that song. And be like, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Sure. But I think people take too much stock in that whatever we say has to be an absolute truth. And if you disagree with me, then you're attacking me as a person. And that's absolutely. like, no, <laughs> we yeah, can have that, discourse. That's, that's ego getting in the way. It's like, yo, it, like that, that's what makes the world go around. Like we like where, where I live is, is a melting pot of all, all, like a lot of different cultures and opinions. And, and because of that, everyone gets along real well. Like everyone just wants their kids to go to school and have a good day and, and have a good lunch and come home and maybe play some video games or, you know, play baseball. Like it, it's, it's just like, we're, we're not that disconnected where you have to argue about every little thing. Like you tell me you like a TV show. I don't like it. So what? I don't, I don't feel attacked that you like something, you know, I'm just not going to watch that show. You go enjoy it, man. Like life is short. And life is very hard and it can be very unfair. If you get an entertainment out of something I don't find entertaining, what what's wrong with that? <laughs> you know, actually, that's kind of interesting. I feel like and maybe you growing up in Long Island and all that in the uh-huh. East Coast, I feel like growing up in the East Coast has instilled in me a work ethic that mm-hmm. – and a, and a lifestyle that I just don't feel like I've seen anywhere else. Like, you know, I make the joke all the time and I sort of alluded to it earlier where it's like, I have never seen more different dialects in such a small area as you do when you go to the East coast, like mm-hmm. growing up in Delaware, we kind of had our own thing, go to Philly. They yep. got its own thing, New York in mm-hmm. different boroughs and areas. They got their sure. own thing. Virginia's got its own thing. Like, and it's weirdly at times Southern. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, but it's like nowhere else do you go. Maybe other than literally the South where the Southern dialect gets turned up or down. I've never seen so much differential dialect and, and vibes as I have in the East coast. But I also mm-hmm. feel like in my traveling around in the, in the, the U S now, at least the East coast just moves and the people you can tell an East coast person versus anywhere else, because I think we, we move quicker. We have more 
we talk faster. We we paint Picassos with our swear words. And <laughs> it's uh, it's one of those things where I just feel like when I find pe- I connect better with people from back east just because I feel like there's just intrinsic thing that we just get about each other right out the gate. And it's kind of weird because like when I went to the West Coast, like I've said to people, I'm like, it's too slow out there. Like people are just mm-hmm. too too lackadaisical like their day doesn't start until like noon or one and i'm like that ain't me like i get up and i gotta go i gotta get i got stuff to do yeah and i realized in a, and i'll pose this to you so when i worked for a company that did screen printing for like major like places like diamond and pack sun and stuff like that we were constantly dealing with, with people out on the west coast and we had to be on their time schedule and i feel like because so much you know especially with new york being a big mecca for like business that they work around the global clock basically of, you know, the Japanese people are up. So we got to be up and we got to get these business Uh deals going and so forth that I feel like we're so it's so ensconced in us from a young age that we have to be cognizant of other areas and other things and and get jobs done quickly that I feel like that just doesn't exist anywhere else because that's not been the environment that people are raised in. Do you, have you ever noticed that or do you feel that way at all? I mean, you, you feel the different paces wherever you go and, and especially like worldwide, you know, as, as you go, you, you see like, I feel like um, the East Coast is similar, like the UK similar, seems to have a similar like hustle and bustle about it, especially like London and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think it all just depends on, on where you go and what areas you're in. And I'm sure like, you know, I'm in the artsy world, but I'm sure in the finance world on the West Coast, it's probably similar. To, to that. So, so I don't know. I mean, I definitely feel, feel the paces, especially when you're, you're in the, the South and stuff, things move a little bit slower and I have to be more patient. I'm like, yo man, I'm in their world. I can't get this coffee line to move any faster <laughs> because that's not my world. It's similar to like, if I go out to a bar now and uh, it's a Friday night and there's a whole bunch of like young 20 year olds and everyone's yelling and everyone's being crazy. I'm like, yo man, I'm on your time. I can't be annoyed or bothered by this because I'm in your world. This is, this was my world. I was the lunatics just like you guys. Now I'm old and slow and whatever. So yeah, I think I think it just depends on where you are and, and where you're at and stuff. But um, yeah, I I don't know, I don't know. Um, I I think it, it just depends on on the circles you're probably moving in with that stuff. You just hit on something that I've. It's funny as I've gotten older, I think it's been funny to grow with some of my friends who are like I said, you know, having families and so forth, and we're not and going. You know, I we one of our favorite watering holes where I actually met my wife uh, is, nice. clo- is gone now. And we were talking about one of the last times we all went. They're like, oh, that bar went downhill, you know, after we stopped going. Mm-hmm. I go, no, we got older. Like that yeah. bar never wasn't really catering to us anymore. It was catering to the the young 20s and the young business professionals. And we and who we out, were. Yeah, we grew out of that era of our lives. Like, so, yeah, yeah when you go. Like the people we knew that worked there the whole time that we would go there, they left and like stuff like that. But it's it's like anything. It ushers in a new new era of things and not everything is meant for you all the time. It's not. Yeah. And that's that's the one thing. And it sounds and it might get me into hot water, I guess, potentially. But it's the one thing I feel like in this everything has to be tailored to me and my experiences and what I want. I feel like that's the one thing that everyone seemingly has kind of forgotten is that not everything has to be inclusive to you. Like, yeah, that's sort of the nice thing about having niche things is like and getting older is like maybe you don't want to go to the loud, noisy bar. Maybe you want to go to a place like sort of in my photo where it's like you got all these nice 10, 12, 15 year scotches and it costs some money to go there. And yeah, it's a little bit quieter. And the the conversations you're actually having while you're having these drinks are a little bit more meaningful because you have Uh more life experiences behind you. And I feel like there's a little bit of that as I've gotten older and seeing the generation, the generation coming up behind us, which I do love some of the changes that they've made globally for us and being more outspoken and talking about important things. Sure. But I feel like at times, sometimes they miss the point of when sometimes the exclusivity or earning something or having something not be for you is where you kind of get appreciation for something. I know that's a really yeah. weird way to say it, but I think you kind of understand where I'm going with it. No, yeah, I understand. And like, I like things when they're not for me. 
like I like experiencing that and seeing like, man, I've, I've kind of come a long way when I'm in that crowded bar on a Friday night. I'm like, wow. <laughs> OK, yeah, that guy, that guy over there, he's me. I see him. He's he's kind of falling asleep in his drink. I he's not gonna <laughs> have a good morning. Man, that was OK. We've come a long way. And, and like and, and that makes me think like, man, I was so stressed about these little problems and all that. It seems so big back then. OK, what am I stressed about now that in 20 years I'm going to look back and that, man, that was really, really silly. So, like, I like having those experiences. You know, I don't want to do it all the time, of course, but just kind of witnessing the fact that I can be in these uncomfortable situations and I'm okay and the world is not all meant for me and and I'm okay. Like, my house is meant for me and my wife, my kids. Like, that, <laughs> that's the stuff that's important, you know, and, 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 and what's going on in the outdoor world. Like, let them have their thing. And that's fine. But, yeah, yeah, like, it, it, I feel like it's important to experience that discomfort, too whether it's, it's your work life or whatever, to keep your brain going and, and to figure out how to interact in those situations and how to get along and be all right. Yeah, I I can think of a lot of interesting mm-hmm. situations I've, I've walked into not because I guess I'm not afraid to, to be challenged in some way, shape or form. Like uh, I remember driving by with my wife one night. We were going somewhere and we saw a bunch of goth kids standing outside uh-huh. a, a not goth bar and we're like, what's going on over here and we drove by and got stopped at a light or a stop sign and one right. of the guys like was like pull down your window and he's like do you want to come in and i was like and he's dressed very vampiric and had like the teeth uh-huh. and all that stuff and i was like i was like i know the lore is a vampire can't come in unless you invite them in but i was like <laughs> does that apply the opposite way like yeah and is they're he like inviting me in so he can get me well it wasn't necessarily like that it was just playing into the joke of it all but and you know we went and like it wasn't all the same kind of music I was into, but I was like, all right, this is kind of cool and different and whatever. And it was funny, like telling people about it. They're like, you just went to this goth club. And I was like, yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah. It was a wacky like, time. Yeah, it was fun. And we've gone and done equally weird things like that, where it's like, oh, like, and that's been the fun thing of traveling. A lot of times is before we used to travel and would kind of go do somewhat touristy things. But now our, our favorite thing to do is like, you know, when we went to Atlanta the first time, we went to this pizza place that doesn't exist. They sold pizza by the slice. And we're like, hey, where where do you go? Uh-huh. And the lady was like, you guys seem pretty cool. So I'm going to tell you this cool little spot. It's called the Elmer. Um, you have to get this thing called the Grizz. And da 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 da. And like, because of that, like we went. It's where I go all the Like literally every day nice. I'm in Atlanta, I go there. We get a Grizz and or a bunch. Um, I now have a friend that like I talk to pretty consistently that like I've made a, a quote unquote best friend, I guess yeah. because I went there and met this guy. And it's one of those things where it's like, had we not been willing to just go somewhere and have an adventure, I don't know that like I would have these experiences and these met these people that I've now met and then been able to bring other people to these spots and kind of showcase like this thing that I've learned to love and enjoy about somewhere else and just kind of soaking in new culture and experiences. Yeah, and maybe if you went like to the the Dave and Buster's or the Hooters or something, you'd be like, well, I could do that in any city. Maybe Atlanta's not so special. Now you have a special connection to the city and great memories and new friends. Like that, yeah. and that's what life's all about. So hell yeah. What uh, you know, kind of speaking to that, I mean, something that I've been kind of thinking about a little bit more uh, in listening to this record, and like I said, kind of going back to you know two thousand what two thousand five. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I remember hearing rumblings about this live record from you guys back then. And then it just seemingly never came out. And it, this is really kind of before the internet existing in the way that it does where I could just go, what happened to that? And then find an interview or a soundbite from one of you going, Oh, well the footage was kind of lost or whatever. But yeah. you know, when you're, I feel like being a, a quote unquote new band at the time and the, the budget that probably you had to recoup to pay for this live recording that you shot and all that kind of stuff to have something like that be so professionally and creatively rewarding. You know, it's, it's what 1200 cap room. You guys sell out. Everyone's excited, you know, sounds great. You know, by the little presser thing, you know, it was talking about how excited you guys were in the energy in the room that you can hear to lose the footage. Are you just kind of like, Oh fuck man. Like that sucks. But I guess like it's even more special now because it existed as every live show does for the crowd we played for. Yeah, I mean this this is one of those things like it was such a it was a magnificent night. It was a benefit for my friend who had been in a serious work uh, accident, had, had significantly injured himself. We were trying to raise some money for his, his medical bills and stuff. 
and we did and, and it was it was beautiful we flew some friends up to, to play the show and uh kevin divine was there um our friends uh uh who were in the band north star uh came and played an acoustic set and uh and and it was just a magnificent night uh michelle uh, uh john's sister uh, now michelle de rosa had a whole dance troupe come out we had an entire string section and it was one of those nights where the band like we couldn't have done a better job under all that pressure like I've had a lot of those nights where they can be hit or miss. Like this, maybe something's off in your mix or like you, you're expecting this big glorious night and it just doesn't work out and it's crushing this. We, we all hit it. The string section was great. The dancers were great. The vibe in the room was great. Our management had done a lot of work to make the show happen. And we're like, wow, we really did it. Then we started to hear the audio mixes that our friend Brian Russell had recorded. And we're like, wow, this is sounding amazing. Then we see the video footage and we go, Oh, we can't, we can't release this. Like this was a magical night and a wonderful moment. And we did something really good. And like, we, we can't put this out. We can't put our name on it. So it was crushing. So we just kind of put it on the back burner for all of these years, wondering how we could, like, there was no way to redeem the, the visual footage, but we're just like, well, I guess we're going to sit on it and, and we will figure out another method to put it out or something. Then interest in the band started waning and, and things just went downhill financial crisis hit the United States. Everything was a mess, perfect storm. And I kind of just forgot about it. Hmm. Then some things started happening. Things started coming around more recently. And there was interest in Straylight Run again. And there, there was interest in, in putting this out. And we signed a deal with Craft Recordings to release this stuff. They bought up almost all of Victory's catalog and stuff. And they said, hey, we want to do something with this. We said, you got to be kidding me. We, we would love this to see the light of day. And suddenly here we go again. And Straylight is kind of a thing. And maybe we'll play some shows and maybe this thing will actually come out and people will get to hear it at least because the audio sounds magnificent. And like listening back now, all these years later, I'm like, I thought it was good then. This is even better than I had remembered. And we got a nice new mix on it. It sounds clean. It sounds good. And the label's interested in promoting it. Like this is an, an amazing, perfect storm. Like everything that went wrong in the past back in 2005 is going right now in 2021 uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, like what are the odds of that? And let's take advantage of this. So, so we feel really, really fortunate that we can finally release this thing. And, and it's, it, it's great. I'm very excited for everyone to hear the full thing. And we, we've put a lot of time and effort into making it sound good and, and the artwork and everything. So I, I'm very excited to, for this to finally see the light of day. It's almost, it was kind of funny in, in reading, like I said, the, the like bio behind, the whole thing, it kind of reminded me of a life lesson that I've kind of taken as I've gotten older, where it's like, especially doing this podcast, like there are so many times I'll try to get someone and it just doesn't happen. And then maybe a couple of years go by or whatever. And then all of a sudden now the opportunity is there. And so it's, it's a lesson in what may be deemed a failure or something not successful. Isn't necessarily that it's that it's, it's, what a, a fellow podcaster, maybe you know him, Dewey, uh, that Dewey Halpas that used to does Pure Pleasure podcast uh, and used to be in Anatomy of the Ghost and uh, uh, Portugal the Man. He always says, it's not a no, it's just a no right now. Yeah, yeah and, not yet. And so it's one of those like where I feel like maybe, maybe it just wasn't the right time for this to come out. And it really did need to take someone who cared and wanted to, to actually give this the release it deserved versus you know, everyone knows kind of how victory and Tony were and are, but where it's just one of those where it's like, Oh, is it not going to make me money? Fuck it. Then I don't, I don't care and whatever. And it's not going to get the attention and, and love that it deserved that all of you obviously put into it when you listen to it. Yeah. And I mean, the, the thing was like, it wasn't necessarily victory and stuff with, with, with anything. It was just, we had a vision for the thing and, and a full like DVD release because there wasn't streaming then. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it wasn't that. So we didn't even, I, I don't even think it was really discussed maybe doing audio only or something or like that we had just put out the first record and, and I think the EP was coming out. So it was like the timing wasn't really right for an audio only thing. Like we had just put out all those songs anyway. So it's like, okay, well here they are again, live. Cool. Actually, so, so it was just like the, the whole vision just went out the window when the video was not proper. The irony, though, is in thinking back to that, that was basically the time frame where that was what everyone yeah. did. Like, 
I can't and the used is really one of the bigger ones but victory records was really good at doing this with their bands where you would have the record you tour your cycle on it and then basically right when you're recording your new your follow-up that's Mm -hmm. when they would put out either a live album or the reimagined version of the cd with either a compilation inside or things like that and something i had actually learned over the years is and victory is so smart with this um one of the few things that tony was really good at with this is that a lot of those repackaged things that either had the extra cd or dvd or whatever that those count as an extra sale so even though it's one one unit technically as the package because there's two discs that counts as two units sold right and i thought that was so smart uh, as I learned that, I was like, well, that's why I have like seven different versions of Suicide Notes and Butterfly Kisses because like <laughs> Tony understood like or like whatever. It's like Tony uh-huh. understood like how to generate sales. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it was one of those. I was like, that is such a smart thing to have done. <laughs> 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 that I'm surprised that honestly, even with the EP or whatever coming out, that he didn't release like repackage the first record or the EP with the live uh, album or something like that and just kind of try to push something that was already money was already spent on and try to recoup some of it in some way, some shape or form. Yeah. And I don't, I don't remember exactly and because the, the contract was done with the EP too. So, mm. so we were like, I, I don't know. Like, I think, I think the band might've funded the recording and stuff. I don't remember how, like, I don't remember how the money moved around <laughs> and stuff from, from all that, all that time ago. But yeah, it was just all, all I remember is being so, so depressed that we couldn't, put out the uh the footage but yeah it was just like okay well that that's done and it seemed like the label might have been losing interest in us too who knows i i don't i can't even remember uh all the details but um yeah yeah it's very interesting bringing back a lot of wacky memories from that time speaking of kind of i don't know if wacky memories is the the phrase but something in and you're one of the few really I think I, in the almost five years and 300 episodes where I can really kind of ask this question and, and get yeah. an interesting answer back, potentially you're in such a unique position, having been in two bands that are so wrapped in nostalgia for people. Mm-hmm. What is that like where and I'm kind of working my way through the question, but mm-hmm. what is it like to be a part of a band where so many people have such a like i it, it's in it's ingrained in them that your music and and that you grew up like they grew up with you essentially but also maybe in some capacities that that's as far as they ever went with you like they haven't grown completely with you into whatever you're doing that's new like is it kind of weird to exist as almost a past version of yourself in someone else's eyes no it's just that uh, you know um it, it's just nice to exist at all uh, when when we were writing Tell All Your Friends, it, in my head, the goal was to make a record, hopefully get a record deal. Um, like we're, uh, Mark and I have, have played, our drummer and I have played in bands since we were young kids, and we couldn't even find a singer. Then uh, we met up with Eddie and Adam and John, and we finally had a group of like-minded people who were like, okay, let's write some songs. Let's go on the road. Let's do this thing. It's like, whoa, we're all into this. Then we started writing songs that we all really liked. So then the goal is, all right, let's play some shows and hopefully let's record this EP. Let's record what songs we have. And and maybe some of our friends will come to the shows and sing along. So it's like the dream was always, I mean, the dream was as grand as, as you could be. But the, the realistic hope is that we could play some shows around Long Island and whatever. Then suddenly we get a record deal. It's like, okay, well, maybe we can tour on this through the summer. Then I'll go back to, to college and, uh, and, and I'll, then I'll get on with my life and, and, you know, find whatever job because I don't know anyone that plays in a band for a living <laughs> for a year, let alone 20, making a living and, and providing for the family. So, like, it, yeah, it's like that's not going to happen. But maybe some people sing along and that'll be cool. So so to, to even be referenced by anyone uh, who, who got into this record with and to tell your friends 20 years ago and, and connects with the, both bands I, I did is, uh, is amazing. So if they stop listening after the first couple of records like that, that's fine. Um, it seems like, you know, we, we continue to grow and pick up new people or remind people of who we are. So maybe like we were talking about earlier, bring it full circle is maybe they were done with us for a while, but maybe they're picking it up now. So maybe the, the self-titled record we did 10 years ago, it wasn't not yet. And maybe they're into it now. I like, so we we've seen nothing but growth with our band since John and I came back 10 years ago. 
and we've kind of gradually leveled up and and i think we've evolved as songwriters so if we've had to do that on maybe it's not on the the grand scale where the band was in 2005 but we we've had really really solid careers and you know our, our kids aren't wanting for anything we we we're continuing to survive through a pandemic after a long time long layoff and stuff so so it's amazing to know that that anyone is stuck with our band and is still listening that many years later so i i'm grateful for it all yeah i think like it was kind of interesting because when i looked up uh the theater because i was like what does this theater hold Mm -hmm. and it's like a i think a 1200 cap room Mm -hmm. and to to think of that because like it's i love a lot of music and a lot of times i love following other musicians when they go to something else either whether it be a solo project or whatever because it's interesting to be able to then see what that person individually kind of brings to the table in the band that you maybe you didn't hear the influences uh-huh. before and it was kind of interesting thinking about how in such a short amount of time you're you're able to and granted i know it's a, a hometown theater so there's a little bit of that too but not discrediting that in a very short amount of time you guys went and are playing theaters that quickly and the other side of that is like you know i was thinking about when foo fighters started and they were showing like footage of the first couple foo fighters tours don't give a fuck that dave Grohl was from nirvana that didn't yeah. get them any success they still had to like re-establish and re-earn all mm-hmm. the fandom that they now have to where the now they're you know who they are now but it's interesting to to see how quickly people actually did kind of support and follow you and both bands really it's one of the few instances i can think of where both bands were able to be successful and one didn't just drop off and was looked at as the the lesser than and it's it's really interesting to see that because i i I can point to so many other bands i mean shit i (laughs) even ties to taking back sunday i booked fred shortly after he had left the band and he literally came, it was like, I have one date and I'm in your area. Can you make a show happen in like three days? And I was like, best I can do is this bar. And he's like, okay. So like we did it and it was really cool and getting to talk to him and and stuff like that. But it was one of those where I'm like, no one really like hit the name and his name or even taking back Sunday's name didn't really matter. People weren't really coming out. And like, I've done that with Joe from fallout boy when he had a side project. Like I booked him at a coffee shop Mm -hmm. and paid him like $200, like literally handed him the money. He was like, thank you so much for giving me the money. Like I was like, dude, like you're in fucking fallout boy. And you're stoked that I gave you $200 Uh to like play this coffee shop. And like, no one was there. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of those things where I realized that like people aren't, I guess like me where they will follow. And I've seen more stories of non-successful side projects than I have where yeah. people follow him. So it, like I said, you're kind of the anomaly of being in not one, but two and having success with them pretty, pretty quickly right out the gate and sustaining yeah. that, that success as well. Well, I mean, you know what, what John and I did leaving taking back Sunday as we were on strapped to a rocket ship to the moon was crazy and a horrible, horrible idea, but it's what we <laughs> felt we had to do at the time. You know, like normal people don't do that. Like you're achieving your dream for the first time ever. And you're just going to be like, oh, no, I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. Um, So so that was really wild. And it was wildly controversial. And the Internet was just gaining steam and stuff. So a lot of that, all the rumors and innuendo and stuff behind the scenes was was made this way around. So it was was such a controversial, wacky thing that there was a lot of interest in the band at the start of it. So and, and a lot of that was was victory too, like really pushing the hell out of taking back Sunday, pushing the hell out of us and stuff. We sold a lot of records and stuff like unheard of numbers for nowadays. You know, it's insane. <laughs> but but uh, but yeah, so there was all that. It was all like what a lot of like weird right place, right time kind of thing. And and it was real. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to leave this band and make a million dollars doing a completely different style of music. It was like, we just have to do this like. When John and I left Taking Back Sunday, we didn't have a plan for a band. It kind of just evolved over nights drinking and thinking like, man, what the hell did we do with our lives? Like, I know we had to do it, but what do we do next? Well, you want to start a band? I'm not doing anything. You're not doing anything. We're hanging out all the time anyway. Might as well play some songs and see what we can do. So so I think there's a, there's a part of that, too. Like, it was it was real. And I think it was for the right reasons. I think, like, the thing that I'm taking away from that personally, and maybe it's just because, like, I've kind of been going through it a little bit myself with some other facets of my life, but it's knowing when you don't want something in spite of how the perception may be from the outward. um, 
but that you have a feeling and you're going to follow that feeling and that in doing that, you're going to be more fulfilled in some capacity. Um, you know, you, you joke that, you know, like everyone's saying like, Oh, the, the rocket ships going, you maybe saw that. And we're like, I don't, I don't want what this looks like. It's about to turn into, I don't want to be gone for two years, barely see my wife or my anybody and the headaches that are already starting to exist because of the pressures that are already being put on. I don't want that. That's not what, again, sort of like I said in the beginning, you started a band for one reason. Yeah. And then subsequently all the other things that happen happen. And that either makes you want to keep going or it drives you further away from that thing. And I feel like it's more commendable, actually, as especially as I get older, for you to realize at such a young age, you're like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. This, at least yeah. in this capacity, in this iteration. And I'd rather find fulfillment in doing something else and knowing that, like, at least I'm staying true to myself. If that is kind of what it meant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. And then also with John and I coming back, which is now has been over a decade back in taking Max Sunday, like that all lined up oddly after seven years of being away from it. It was just really weird. Like pl- everyone's places in their lives with their families. And, and it, like, it was just shockingly bizarre that it was absolutely the right move at the time. Like I, 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 I thought I was, I, I thought that was the time to get my real job and, and figure things out. And I was like, calling my dad hey can you call my uncle and then see if he can get me in there and and you know see if i can get started like you know i met the girl i'm gonna marry and stuff and time to time to get on my life and he's like you know what sean to give it a couple months and see see where you land like i like you might be ready to, to throw in the towel like i don't think you are you know and i was like really and he we i had no idea yeah how could my dad have any idea but he was smart he was wise and something <laughs> did come along and, and here we are and, uh, and and then and then the fact with all the straight life stuff happening again in this time is also equally strange and, and wonderful. It just seems right. I mean, in light of going through something like that, you know, like I, I kind of said a little bit ago about the it's it's not a no, it's a no right now. Like essentially yeah. kind of saying like some things just work themselves out, but it maybe not in the perceived timeline or fashion that you had hoped mm-hmm. does kind of going through traversing going through from taking back Sunday to straight light and then adversely back to taking back Sunday. How has those things manifesting changed how you approach things in your actual day to day life? I always try and not get stressed at, at the stuff that seems so significant in the moment. Hmm. Um, easier said than done. I had a, I had a clogged sink and I drove to get the liquid plumber from the store the other day. And then I got a, I got a hole in my tire, a big nail in there. I'm like, ah, the kids are screaming. They're not eating their vegetables. I'm like, the world is collapsing. What are we doing? So it's like in those moments, I'm like, Hey man, it's all going to be okay. These problems are not very significant. And I've handled them all. Like today I got the tire fixed and the clog is done and the kids are happy. And like, Hey, it's 24 hours later and, and things, things are good. So maybe some things take a little bit longer to work out. Like, Hey man, I want the pandemic to be over. I'm ready. Believe it or not. Um, let's go. It's a year and a half. So, um, I'm ready to get back to work and it's going to get there. Like we're going to get there. Not as timely as I'd like it. Not as easily as I'd like it. Um, we got some shows coming up in September. I'm so pumped about. So it's like all of those things I'm trying to pull back and relax. Like, is this pandemic still going to be a problem five years from now? If it is, I don't know what the hell's going on, but I try and take myself out and I see the timelines of my life and, and where the bands were and, Sometimes it took a long time to to work things out, but we always got there. I always got there in one way or another. So I, and I always land in a better spot than I was previously. So, so that is my theory with everything in life. I think it's just kind of hard. I feel like at times like someone, it's interesting because in looking at your career and looking at how basically, excuse me, there, there was, you guys left. And then all of a sudden it's like, here's this new band. And then everyone's like, well, why would you leave one band to start a new one and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. But the thing that's always interesting. And I was just kind of talking about this with the interview I had just done before you where, you know, we as fans see things in our art, get things when dealing with bands or whatever, well, after they've been done. But like what we don't see is all the things that basically, we're percolating behind the scenes to get us to this point. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting when talking about a record and people are like, well, I really like this record. And it's like, 
yeah, potentially you as the artist have already between demoing, starting everything, pre-production, recording, and then finally having it done. And then whenever it gets released, you know, because the label might be like, we want to put this out in quarter four for whatever mm -hmm. reason to go inside with this this tour, whatever. Um, you might be a year, a year and a half removed from that already. And mm -hmm. you're already starting something else. But we as the listeners and we as the fans are just getting this the first taste of whatever now and you were excited about that where you're like, yeah, that was cool, but I'm already moved on to the next thing, which you're not going to hear or see about for another two years. And it's it's weird because we perpetually are behind whatever you're doing currently. Like we never are and even still in, in today's 24 hour news cycle. We're hardly ever caught up with what you're doing. And so it's always weird. Like I said, like anything you do, it's what you've done. And we hardly ever get to see what you're currently working on in real time to then be excited about that as well. And I feel like that's just it's a weird way to have to live a life in any kind of creative and professional fashion where it's like you're constantly being judged on something that is based on experiences and things that have already happened to you versus it happening to us now for the first time. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a tricky thing. I think what all of us in Taking My Sunday have is that we get really excited to play the new songs for people. So like when, when our last record title wave came out, we did an entire tour playing the record from start to finish really small venues and stuff. So we knew the people that would be there would be most passionate and most interesting, most interested in hearing an hour of new music before we got into the older stuff. And it was awesome, man. Like we had so much fun doing that. So I think like with, with our creative process now it's been that record came out in 2016. So it's, so it's five years in between probably before our next record comes out, it's probably going to be six years between releases. Um, we're going to be really passionate about putting the new songs out. And I, I think we're entering a new prolific period with taking back Sunday where hopefully there won't be as much time in between records and stuff and hopefully no more pandemics. So I think we're going to, um, we're, we're going to, we're going to turn out stuff and it's going to be a, a much quicker process. And I think the world has, has a, has adapted to that too. It's much easier to get medium out now in, in a quicker way with streaming platforms and stuff. So maybe there's not going to be the big turnaround time and maybe the, the, the songs aren't going to languish as much. And like, I definitely had frustrations like trying to, trying to write songs uh, from afar, but now we've finally been able to get in the same room and start working on them. And things have been moving really, really quickly when we're able to get in the room, like we're all in different States and stuff. So that's kind of tricky. But um, man, I, I think those windows are going to get uh, much smaller. And especially, I, I only know as it pertains to, to my bands, that um, we're going to work in a, in a much more efficient manner. So maybe there isn't such a big delay in the future. I wonder at times if that actually works or is a detriment to an album success where maybe an album comes out and people are like, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. And then it's so long, you know, between touring cycles or whatever, and just getting to record another record that then people are like, I've had time to sit with this now. And now I really appreciate this for, for what it is. I mean, a classic example, I feel like of, of that sentiment is refuse shake the punk to come uh -huh. when that record came out. Like now everyone knows how much of a landmark record it is, how it still is timeless, how it has influenced so many other bands. But when that record came out and the thing everyone forgets, everyone hated it. It was not Fan yeah. the Flames of Discontent. Everyone hated it. Mm -hmm. The band broke up shortly after they made it. Then they went away. And then now 10, 10 or 12 years after it came out, now the band has this, this masterpiece. And it's like, where the fuck were all of you when this came out and you hated it? Like, yeah. that's an example of, I think, time allowing people to look at something and grow with it and kind of mm -hmm. be able to, to not be in that first uh, mentality of like oh this doesn't have rather be dead so pff, this sucks or whatever and it's like i wonder as i've seen some of your back catalog and and some of the stuff of like when you mm -hmm. weren't in the band like to me one of my favorite records of taking back sundays for a while which hot take was new again um, i loved the growth and kind of the the low-key aggression on that record uh -huh. it, it was very kind of angry mm -hmm. and i love that record and when a lot of people were like this record sucks and i'm like there's there's really interesting playing. There's really interesting lyrics. Yeah. Some of the stuff that the, is happening on this record is it's actually kind of what you wanted. Like, you know, I made this comment to someone the other day, bringing in a completely different band, but Limp Biscuit. So 
one of my favorite Limp Biscuit songs and EPs is the unquestionable truth. And it was when Wes had rejoined the band and they went back to Ross Robinson and recorded like a four song EP. It's raw as hell. It sounds a lot like $3 bill y'all. And everyone was just like, I wish they would go back to that sound. That's the record that everyone said they wanted. And then no one, no one knows about it. It's like, I know they dropped it kind of out of nowhere, but it, it's weird. Cause like when I play stuff off of it, people are like, this is really good. What is this off of? Uh, it's like, this is like 12, 15 years old at this point, man. Like same with that. Like, I feel like a lot of people were like, Oh, we want like the old taking back Sunday sound. And it's like, there's a lot of like kind of the, yeah. the tongue in cheek, really sharp, razor sharp wit lyrics uh, in that record. But it's kind of, and when you guys would come and do the self-titled record shortly after, I feel uh, like that's, that's the bridge record yeah. for old and new and kind of where you guys went from there. And I don't feel like a lot of people, either they just haven't taken the time to appreciate it or they haven't realized that even going back that like that really is the transitional record of what you guys have been doing to, in my opinion, over the last 10 years of kind of becoming a more adult band, if that makes any sense. Sure. I, and I think, you know, that that's also the problem we were discussing earlier, like the reactionary thing, like, well, I listened to three songs for about 30 seconds each skip, skip, skip. And yeah, I mean, I didn't really give the record any time. Like if there's a record that's not connecting with me, I'll listen to it about three times front to back to make sure if there's nothing really there. I mean, like there, there are some records that are definitely growers for me. And, and like by the third listen, I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I get what they're doing, but uh, there's other records that are, it's immediate. Yeah. And uh, so, so I feel like um, you have to give every record a little bit of time. If you give a shit about the band, if you don't, cool too. Move on. You know why? Why sit there wasting your time? But I feel like uh, when New Again came out, it was a very tricky time in the band. That just the scene that Taking Back Sunday uh, came from was considerably uncool and stuff, and people weren't really listening to rock music and stuff. And and it was just I, I don't know. It, it was a it was a weird time just in the world and stuff where where rock music was concerned. And I think it's kind of come around a bit. Uh, just where where the world is and not and appreciating guitar rock um, where, where that really wasn't the case um, right in, in that moment. So I feel like we're passionate about what we do. We really believe in it. We have our corner of the Internet that's pretty strong and stuff. So I feel like with whatever we're doing or wherever we're going, we're going to spend time making sure people hear whatever comes next. And uh, and we, we hope people actually take time to, to listen to what we're doing and understand it and and know when there's a record like tell your friends that that was so revered that you've had 20 years to listen to that. And you have memories from 20 years ago that you might associate with that, that you haven't developed from something that's new. So maybe this is new. Maybe this is different. May, I mean, maybe we're not the band for you anymore. Okay, move on. But if, if you care, like give it, give it a second and, and try and pay attention because I feel like um, we're, we're evolving and we're growing and I, I feel like we're only getting better. And I mean, I could be wrong. Well, no, but I think everyone, does, everyone, everyone for their own appreciation needs to take a minute. You know, if there's a new TV show, I'll give it a few episodes before I call it quits. And uh, so I feel I hope it's the same with our stuff. I wish uh, my wife was that way. She'll give a show like three minutes and be like, this show sucks. And I'm like, yeah, I don't even know everybody yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I get I, you know, I, I understand, too, you know, maybe something so off putting that you can't stand another second. But uh, I'm only that way with reality TV. I'm like, what? Oh, that's what I can she's tell us this, is, tell us this scripted. Yeah. Yeah. That's her bread and butter is the, the real house hose of whatever city that she happens to be watching. And Actually, I'm like, for someone that hates. Very big. Yeah. Uh, the only one that I got into for a hot minute was uh, the Melbourne one because the drummer from Silver Chair's wife was in it. So you would see him on occasion. Oh, crazy. But then it stopped being That's broadcast weird. here in the States. So then my interest was gone. <laughs> um, kind of a last couple of questions for you as we sure. were wrapping up. Um, I saw on your Instagram the other day. I don't know when it was the I think it was a pretty recent post, but your shower beer. Uh, yeah. There's been times where like we're all have had like a long day or whatever. I'm like, uh, turn the shower on for me, crack open a beer and just leave it in there for me. I'll get there. Or even as I've resorted to on occasions, shower whiskey Cokes. Uh, mm -hmm. nice. um, so it's one of those things. Like, I feel like I thought it was a, a pretty known thing that like shower beers, but it seems like it's not as well known. So uh, do you get strange looks when you, uh, <laughs> when you uh, end up uh, doing that? Or is that kind of a, still a, a just a, a nice relaxing way to end your day? 
No, it's a very rare thing for me. Mm. With with that day, that it was from long ago enough. I remember I was out shoveling snow, so it was freezing cold, and I worked up a hell of a sweat. I was drenched because it was all bundled up and stuff. Like I remember, I had my face mask on just because it was so cold. Mm. But like we had probably three, four feet of snow, and my walkway is pretty big and stuff, and I had to shovel out the cars and stuff. So I was working my ass off. Probably burned like a thousand calories. And I was so hot and sweaty, but also cold that that frigid you get, you know, just like, man, I need I need a hot shower and a cold beer, knock off some of the this uh, this muscle tension and stuff. And oh, man, it was glorious. I just sat in there <laughs> for a while and the beer was so cold and I have a gluten intolerance thing. So I get gluten free beer mm. and uh, it works much better my uh, for my gut. And man, it was it was a great day, and I'll I'll never forget like the the coming in with the satisfaction of knowing I did a good job and I salted everything, kept the walkway safe for anyone walking through, and no one was going to slip and fall and break their necks. And I got the cars out, so if we got to get some food, we're good. We can get our groceries. And man, this beer is delicious. That was that was a treat. But yeah, highly recommended, especially after a hard day's work like that. Something you cut the grass. You're shoveling, you're doing, you know, whatever you got to do. It, it's a, it's a good way to end the day. But yeah, man, that was, that's a glorious time, making me miss the cold weather. <laughs> oh, it's, it's coming pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm gonna I, hate it two weeks in. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I will say, like, the greatest thing I ever did was because I here in Michigan, especially in Grand Rapids, we get just dumped on, and yeah. uh, so I invested in like a pretty cheap, like a hundred, hundred fifty dollars snowblower, and was just like. I'm like one day I was like, I'm tired of my back being like, and every two hours, like having to bundle back up and then taking all this time. And I was like, I'm just going to get a snowblower working yeah, smarter, nice. not harder. Um, Hell yeah. So, and then it makes me feel, and because I know I'm not doing much actual work, like then I've been, I found that I've been even more prone to being nicer to my neighbors. And I'll be like, oh, I'll get your sidewalk and your the mouth of your driveway. And Excellent. And you don't have to, cause like I have this and you have shovels. So whatever. Yeah. But, um, either way on that but like i just saw that and i was like oh it's funny because like sometimes i'll talk to some people about they're like shower beers and i'm like mm-hmm. never had a shower beer so yeah. um a fun question i don't think the band has done this so if if we you have and i've just somehow missed it then apologies but uh-huh. uh take it back like a lot of bands are doing beers now like i uh, my fridge back here i have a bunch of the deftones beers and so forth but uh nice. what would a taking back sunday beer taste like Man, we would go like we we've discussed this a lot too. We would go straight up lager. Mm. Um, we feel like you know so many people have gone hard in the IPAs. We we want like a nice crisp, clean, light lager. You know, probably probably good alcohol content, but like really light, very easy to drink, summer day kind of thing. So so that that's what we would discuss. You know, and 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 we have before if if it, if it comes up, if we can ever make that happen, that would be rad. But yeah, definitely a, a lighter and and lager, easy drinking, and uh, pretty high on the alcohol scale. <laughs> it's always one of those where it's inter- like uh, I feel like it's interesting seeing a lot of these bands come out with stuff. I think really other than Deftones, I feel like Run the Jewels is the only other band or artist that's done it to where it's like they've put out a, a bunch of different ones. So like they're very cognizant of like craft beer scene is is really popular like Mm -hmm. and we want to do something around this season for a release of either a song or an album or a tour or whatever we need to plan that ahead of time so if we're going out in the fall we have a stout or a porter ready yeah and i feel like deftones is one of the few where it's like yeah they're they're i don't think they've really done a logger i'd have to look behind me but um you know a lot of theirs is like browns and stuff like that and they you Mm -hmm. know they have ipas and and stuff like that but it's one of those that they're one of the few that i think has done really interesting job of working with a specific brewery in belching beaver and doing you know making the cans look cool having it celebrate a song or a record and and kind of having it almost encapsulate sort of uh in a flavor profile i guess sort of what like maybe that album represents to them or something um so yeah, it's, it's awesome. kind of it's interesting to kind of just see another creative way to explore something you've done creatively, but doing it in a completely different medium and seeing how people arrive to this is what we're thinking about or like how much thought really has gone into like, if we were to do a beer, yeah, we like, you know, we're kind of light and fun and, you know, uh-huh. about having a good time. So we don't want something where you're kind of one and done. Cause that's not who we are or what our music's yeah, yeah. like. So we want something that, you know, you can sustain and have a good time with over a couple hours and a couple of beers. Um, yeah. 
So it's interesting to just kind of think about how bands approach that. So it was one of those where I was like, I wonder if you guys, it's fun to ask that. Cause like I said, it's just, a, it's a weird question. And the answer is never usually the same. We're like, Oh, we would just be this. Cause I like it. And it's like, Oh, well, I think we'd be this because this is our personalities in, in a flavor profile or whatever. So it's always fun to, to kind of ask that question and just see what someone would come up with. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's what we like collectively. Um, you know, so we write the songs we want to hear. We make the beer we'd want to drink. <laughs> um, lastly, where can everyone find you or whatever you would like to plug online? Yeah, um, Straylight Run is on the internet somewhere. I know Straylight Run on uh, Instagram and, and AOL.com, uh, I believe you said. Is that yeah, where you yeah said? <laughs> AOL, uh, CompuServe. It's one on one of those things. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, uh, TBS official on Twitter, taking back Sunday on uh, Instagram. Don't have enough letters for taking back Sunday on Twitter. It's very annoying, <laughs> but yeah, Straylight run on, uh, on Twitter, Sean W Cooper, Twitter, Sean W Cooper on Instagram, you know, pop up there occasionally. It's a mess <laughs> out there. So, <laughs> well, I, I tend to find those that are actually living their life are too busy to uh, actually be posting about stuff. So that's usually the plan. I like I like that most of the people that I follow that used to be uh, over shares have, have dialed it back a bit and are now posting really good things. That's so, that's, so that's me it's now. Cool yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> but uh, well, that and I noticed that if you don't post every like I probably post maybe on Instagram once a week or every couple of weeks. But I noticed mm-hmm. that if you don't, then because I noticed from friends that do the same, I'll get a notification like, hey, so and so posted for the first time. And it like almost like is a reward for not posting is that like, then it gets a notification sent to everyone. And I'm like, Oh, well, what, what is this person doing that they felt worthy of actually making a post now? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, thank you again for taking the time. And uh, hopefully I know taking back Sunday comes around here to grand Rapids quite a bit. I um, love it there. Yeah, it's great. I love it here. And uh, I don't, I know we have plenty of gluten-free beer around here. So maybe the next time you come through and uh, if the pandemic aside a lot, uh, we'll have to go grab a beer and just bullshit for a little bit. If uh, you're up good, for that, man. I'm totally down. So that was my conversation with Sean Cooper again of taking back Sunday and stray light run. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Uh, it's funny. Uh, a lot of times when you, when I talk to some of these people that like are in bands that I've known of for, for a very long time, it, it's kind of interesting because you're like, Well, I mean, shit, what do you talk about with someone that's been interviewed for 20 some odd years? Like, what can I possibly get out of somebody? How can I make it fun for them? And it becomes this little bit of a challenge. And I and I think that's kind of why I've enjoyed going more away from doing a quote unquote, here's my interview. Let's talk about the record. Let's talk about memories from the touring cycle and all that kind of stuff. And and just kind of talk to someone, because at that point, you're going to get interesting stories out of out of someone that maybe you don't know. And you're going to get to know more about the musicians that you have loved for so long than you would have if I just would have asked standard questions. Um, so it's one of those where I kind of enjoy that. I kind of enjoy now kind of just being like, Hey, look, fuck it. We're going to talk for an hour and just see where it goes, man. And Sean was super gracious with his time. Well, we tried ending it a couple of times and just kept talking and, uh, very much, uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing taking back Sunday or maybe stray light run if they decide to get it back together and play some shows and, uh, maybe have a beer with Sean and, and kind of show him a little bit of, uh, the Grand Rapids, Michigan beer scene. Um, no, he said he had, uh, I believe, a gluten allergy, but there are ways around that. Uh, actually, a lot of places now are making gluten-free beers and, and NA beers and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, just the, the space is expanding. Uh, very much like taking back Sunday Sound has expanded over the years. I did really enjoy that part of the conversation, getting to kind of be like, hey, you know, like, I think this is the transition record between, you know, what fans know and have loved and and kind of where the band is now, even though you weren't necessarily a part of that record. Uh, well, it wasn't a part of that record, but came in basically after that record uh, and the transition kind of started there with John and, and most of the original band kind of getting back together and and kind of playing this, I don't want to call it adult music, but it, it's an adult version of Taking Back Sunday. Um, Dan and I, when Dan was still a part of the show, we talked about that with Emery, how being a part of Emery's musical career, it feels like these last handful of records are really just you growing with a band that has gotten older with you. Um, listening to the new Kanye records and the Jay-Z records that I, that have come out over the last, you know, recently. And then, uh, with Jay-Z a couple years ago, um, you know, I was telling someone, I go, it's interesting to, to look at their careers and you can kind of see the young men they were when they came into the game and then basically shifting into men, especially like Jay-Z's 444 record. That is really a man 
owning some of his own shit and coming out the other end of it and just kind of being like, you know, this is this is where I'm at in my life. And I feel like Taking Back Sunday are one of the few bands that have been around from when a lot of us were kids to now where we're all adults, we're married, we got kids, houses, whatever. And uh, I think it's a cool journey to go on. All of that said, I'm going to start wrapping this episode up. Uh, if you would like to keep up with Sean, he has Instagram, Twitter, Sean W. Cooper. Uh, since this wasn't necessarily really about Taking Back Sunday or a Stray Light Run, you can find them. The pre-orders are still up for the Live at the Patch Hog Theater, uh, or you can just buy it on vinyl, CD. It'll come out on September 17th. Get it, pick it up, uh, go down the nostalgic trip with that. Want to thank our sponsors real quick before we head out. Uh, on Point Palm, keep your beard and hair looking on point. Use our code BSP15, take 15% off your total purchase order. Secondly, want to thank the Bean Bastard. Go to thebeanbastard.com, pick up some delicious coffee, and if you're in the Buffalo, New York area, head on over to their brick-and-mortar store and support those guys and gals and get a delicious cup of coffee or whatever. Fall's coming, you know you're going to want some coffee. And last but not least, I want to thank Rockabilia.com. Go to Rockabilia and pick up some awesome swag. They have over 500,000 items in their online store. I'm sure there's Taking Back Sunday merch. Uh, You can go over there and use our code BRUTALLY, B-R-E-W-T-A-L-O-Y, and take 10% off your total purchase order. So I want to thank all of our sponsors for supporting us. Support them if you are able to. And lastly, before we get out of here, I want to remind you our Patreon is live, www.patreon.com slash brewspeakpod. There is the weekly breakdowns of my weekly playlist that I curate over on Spotify. There is the new side podcast, what I learned from a podcast, and just a whole bunch of other cool shit that I've been doing, plus back episodes of the podcast. And you get to hear every episode that I've already done preemptively before it drops. So with some of these episodes, like you could have heard this episode that you're already listening to now, you probably could have heard it about three weeks ago when I did it. Uh, so with some of these, you know, it takes a little while to get them out week by week, but if you are a member on our Patreon, you will hear everything before it comes out pretty much as soon as I do it. I have a couple interviews coming up this week before I go on my vacation and, uh, you'll be able to hear those as soon as it's done. So a little more bang for your buck. If you would like to uh, hear more of the podcast and support the podcast in another way as well. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John, and I will talk to you all next week when the guest is Justine of Employed to Serve. That was a fun one. Can't wait to get into it with you all then. Have a great week.